So Annika, you yeah. have the vision, the mission to create a secure and transparent voting system for us. How do you explain your, your work, for example, to your parents? <laughs> yeah, so uh, when I tell my parents or anyone else that I work with blockchain, the most common response that I get is, um, oh, so you work with Bitcoin, or isn't blockchain the same thing as Bitcoin? And I think that a lot of the confusion stems from people not realizing that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies all use blockchain technology as their underlying foundation. And that underlying foundation can be used for other applications or transactions, like recording people's votes during elections, for example. So how do we exactly use the blockchain for the voting? Yeah, so by design, uh, the blockchain is a decentralized technology, meaning that a global network of computers, uh, they all jointly manage the database that records transactions for things like Bitcoin. Um, in other words, each one is managed by its own network, rather than any single central authority like a bank or a middleman. Um, and when you really stop to think about that, blockchain is ideal for an application like voting because the power to validate these transactions is spread out amongst this network so that no single person or computer has more authority than any other. Um, they're all created equal, which is important when we consider things like vote tampering and easy to hack voting infrastructures. Sounds good. So like for maybe for some people, it sounds like a bit fugazi fugazi. There's something happening in that blockchain. So is it actually safe? Can it be hacked? Yeah. So actually, uh, earlier this year at DEF CON, which is the world's largest security conference, they showed how it was possible to hack uh, polling stations that are currently in use across the United States. And they did this in under two minutes with no special tools and without any advanced knowledge, which is pretty concerning. It is. <laughs> so I told you before, before we went up here on stage, before the event in the back, that I'm, I actually grew up in a part of Switzerland where we still vote with, with our hands, like show by hand. It's, it's called Appenzell, a very small, small town in the east. Mm -hmm. And for example, such a place like, like where I grew up, uh, like where, where I grew up, um, but we still vote with our hands. So how could we imagine like the, the blockchain voting or just even like a digital voting like taking place? Like would a digital voting make more sense than maybe a voting on a blockchain? What's the difference? Yeah, yeah so let's break that question down a little uh -huh. bit. Um, one major problem is that a lot of voting systems still require people to visit the polling stations in person, which means taking time off from work. And typically people have to stand in line for hours. So due to the sheer inconvenience, uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing a decline in um, election or voter turnout. Uh, in fact, according to the World Development Report that was released in 2017, there has been a global average drop rate of 10% over the past 25 years. So here in Switzerland, um, local authorities have been testing out various e-voting systems as a means of finding a better alternative to uh, traditional paper ballot elections or, you know, raising your hand, for example, um, or electronic voting machines. And the issue with using these e-voting systems is that they all make use of a centralized server. And when you have a centralized server um, containing all of these sensitive voting records, someone out there is going to be interested in accessing that information. Now, this could be an outsider or it could be someone who already has access to that server, um, like a technical provider, for instance. So what this means for voters and election administrators is that they need to place their full trust in the hands of the, this company or this technical provider who is operating and managing these e-voting systems. So they have to trust that this technical provider is going to remain honest in its intentions and that it has the ability to protect this server from any malicious attackers trying to get in from the outside. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> like when I think about Switzerland, it seems like here, for example, it's like it works well, the voting system, either like with the hand or also like the re regular voting. So we don't have 
big problems if, like in other countries where like they there's co like there like is a corrupt government government that maybe is like manip manipulating the the votes uh, like in in such countries like most of the time like, like developing developing countries, developing yeah. countries exactly um, would it also be possible to to implement such a voting system there or is it more like for modern and like rich countries no yeah let's uh, would let's it work yeah yeah let's talk about developing countries for a moment so um, with countries that use paper ballots, um, the printing of materials and transporting of them can add up to 46% of overall election costs, as we saw in the 2012 French presidential elections. And those costs do not include um, paying someone to tally everything up. But if we look at uh, an issue that's more specific to developing countries, um, they have more of an issue regarding the integrity of using paper ballots, which can be compromised at several points throughout an election. So to give you a quick example, um, in the Sierra Leone presidential elections that took place earlier this year, they had a truck containing boxes of ballots, and it was transporting them from a local polling station to the local, or the capital city of Freetown. Now, this truck only had to travel 30 kilometers to reach Freetown. However, it took three and a half days to arrive. So <laughs> during that time, the European Commission, who was overseeing this election, they had no idea where the truck was, what had happened to it, nor did they know whether or not the ballots were being tampered with. Um, so when the truck finally did arrive, they had to decide what to do with all the ballots that it brought with it. And due to time constraints, ultimately they chose to just throw out those votes altogether. So based on this situation alone, it's clear that we need to consider alternative voting systems. As for example, blockchain, right? That, that would work. Like the blockchain or blockchain voting would solve those problems, wouldn't Ideally, it? Ideally, yes. Would it? Okay, <laughs> um, so like outside of trust and transparency, you mentioned, are there other advantages for this kind of voting system? Well, yeah, so let's back up for a sec. Um, the biggest issues that blockchain naturally solve are trust and transparency, as you just mentioned, um, which are ind indispensable in any election. Uh, with, uh, so when you have a decentralized network of computers who all have the same copy of the voting ledger and can update it and, or verify it and update it as more votes come in, it makes tampering with the results very difficult, if not impossible. It also means that no votes can be thrown out. Um, and when you have this um, with blockchain, you would have the votes stored on a publicly accessible ledger so that voters could verify that their choices have been accurately recorded, and they can also bear witness to the validity of election results. Now, um, like you said, outside of trust and transparency, what other advantages are there? Um, and to that, I would respond the advantages of accessibility and affordability. So um, with blockchain, all you would have to do is download an official election app onto your smartphone, um, verify your identity, and cast your vote. And this would all take place in the course of a matter of minutes, which means that the convenience and simplicity of running the election this way would probably result in increased voter participation. What this also means is that you no longer have to travel to your local canton or city to vote. In fact, you don't even have to be in the same country anymore, which is ideal if you happen to be traveling abroad during elections or if you live abroad. Um, and with regard to affordability, um, yeah, with everything distributed and decentralized, there's no longer a need for um, purchasing expensive servers to store voter data nor is there a need to hire a bunch of people to tally paper ballots by hand. Um, with blockchain, all votes are tallied instantly and the, the, um, the results updated in real time. So these are just a few advantages, um, but I think you get the idea. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, but like my, my main concern is like the, the political field is not known to be very innovative, isn't it? Like there hasn't, haven't been many changes in the past. So how far are we away to really see that system in action? Do you have maybe some more information for us yeah, on that yeah, side? Yeah, of course. So uh, blockchain might just be getting started, but we've already seen a few trials that show that it could be implemented um, across a number of local and national elections relatively soon. 
One good example is right here in Switzerland. Earlier this summer, the city of Zouk conducted a municipal vote using a blockchain, uh, a decentralized blockchain voting system. And afterwards, officials declared that it was a lot safer and less susceptible to manipulation than other e-voting systems they've tried out in the past. Another good example is over in the Japanese city of Tsukuba. After their trial run with a blockchain-based voting app, um, they, the local authorities there announced that the main benefit was being able to offer their citizens the ability to vote directly from their smartphone and from the comfort of their, their own homes. So these are just two examples, but I think that they do a pretty good job of demonstrating that we're not too far away from adopting blockchain in future elections. Indeed, indeed. But still, it sounds like a tough challenge, like kind of solving that kind of old-fashioned system, right? Kind of replacing it with something very, very modern. So it's a big challenge. Well, it is. <laughs> I, I believe so. Yeah. So what, what does? But, but why are you so passionate about this? Why are you like following this vision? Yeah. So. Um, for me, it's exciting to see the development and implementation of a real-world application for blockchain, blockchain rather than um, the creation of another cryptocurrency that can be bought and sold. But what makes me so passionate about it has a lot to do with my personal experience with current voting systems. Um, so to give you some background, in 2016, I participated in the US presidential elections. And in my hometown of 500 people, I had to stand in line for over two hours just to cast my vote, which meant taking time off from work and without pay. In fact, a lot of my friends just decided to forego the elections altogether, saying that you know one vote isn't going to make much of a difference in the grand scheme of things. And to be honest, they didn't want to take time off work. So uh, when it finally came time for me to fill out my paper ballot, I was given very little privacy as the elected official who was overseeing our local polling station. She stood uh, looking right over my shoulder and making small talk with me like we were out having coffee rather than deciding our next president. Um, yeah, so it was a very frustrating experience overall. But afterwards, I thought, hey, at the very least, my vote is going to be accurately recorded. And then I discovered months later that it was not, um, that my ballot and my personal data had been compromised, uh, along with millions of others. Yeah. What do you mean, <laughs> what do you mean of compromise? Like, what, what happened exactly? Well, uh, do, you, do you keep up with the news? Do we know it? <laughs> it was, I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to name, I don't want to name okay, okay, names we can also move on. in in so this in, in this event. Yeah. So, but, but after that, they they like reacted. They changed something with the system, but apparently, it didn't really work out, right? Right. So, despite uh, the outrage and protests of U.S. citizens over what happened, as well as the overwhelming evidence to prove that it did, nothing changed. Okay. No voting system was revised or switched out, which is incredibly frust frustrating when you consider that those records contain details like names, phone numbers, full addresses, scans of our government-issued IDs, voting history, all of which can be used to commit voter fraud, along with a plethora of other crimes going forward. Um, it's a major cause for concern. So I think that um, not placing the integrity of our voting systems in the hands of any single person or entity that's the key to restoring trust in democratic elections. And that is also the whole concept that blockchain is based on, a decentralized distribution of trust. So by bringing that same concept over into our voting systems, I think that governments can um, restore public trust and increase voter participation going forward. And um, that said, I hope that people leave here today with an understanding that blockchain cannot, is not just good for creating cryptocurrencies, but that it can also be used to solve uh, deeper issues as well, like bringing trust and transparency back into elections. I think that's a good moment to stop the conversation yeah. here. <laughs> Um, but definitely think about it, and I will ask you then later during our interactive sex section to share your opinion. Annika, thank you very much for your time and sharing your, your work with us. Thank you. Big, big applause for Annika. Thank you.